Gogo, um, I guess, originated originated in um, D.C., but um, I got most of my licks off just by listening, and just by you know listening to the music and, and grooving off it and just kind of playing. You have to swing all the sixteenth notes that you're playing to try to keep that feel because what happens is, you know, the drummer's usually laying down a solid groove and all the percussionists in Gogo kind of like keep that swinging 16th note type of feel because they're playing a lot on top. They're playing, they might play a pattern like doom ba, ka doom doom ba, do doom doom ba, ka doom doom ba. And then you gotta just kinda lay it right in there and just like doom ba, goom, goom, ba, goom, goom, and keep it solid. But I don't know, when you're playing by yourself, um, I like to add all those notes. I like to play a bunch of stuff with my, uh, I, I like to add all the notes that the percussionists is play, are playing in order to capture that feel. Like maybe with my left hand, I'll play a lot of the percussion parts with um, a kunga or something on the left or, or um, you know, with some, some of the toms to kind of get that, kind of get that feel, that, that swing and feel that makes uh, go-go, you know, so, so special. In go-go, um, the swing is more like the, uh, the pulse is more on the ones, and, I mean the downbeat, the quarter notes. So if you have notes, so the swing is more like one, two, where like in the older style, like big band, you know they would emphasize the swing maybe on like the upbeat, so it'd be more like So it's it's a little heavier feel to me. That's that's what I like about it. That's why I kind of picked up on it. In this next lesson, we're going to learn about go-go. The first beat you're going to hear is what I consider the most basic go-go groove. In this next beat, I'm adding some 16th notes to the hi-hat and bass drum to exaggerate the swing. Now I'm adding even more notes to the hi-hat and kick drum.
By adding some 16th note triplets to the bass drum, you can give the go-go beat a more rock feel. That's a quality head right there. Oh yeah. <laughs> I figured if I, I if I had to put a new one on, it'd be like stupid. It's all about the sound. The go-go sound. If it was bought in the store, you don't want it. It's the whole concept about go-go getting that sound. I found most of this stuff to try to get that sound. You think it'd be funnier to whisper everything? Buddy Rich and you see Gene Krupa when I was, you know, growing up wanting to learn how to play the drums, you know, I would see them do, you know, I'd see them ripping on a snare drum, doing all this like crazy technique. And, you know, they'd be going from loud to soft, you know, accented notes to non-accented notes and, you know, all this crazy dynamics on the drum, on the snare drum. You know, I, I asked my teacher, how do you gain this control over the, the snare? You know, I was just like amazed. He said, you, you know, you have to practice this up-down technique because what that what it's doing is you know it's going through each one of those strokes he's doing separately and gaining control over that first before you can put the whole thing together. Play all of these strokes at a slow tempo. Stay relaxed, but keep your reflexes quick. The full stroke starts at a 90 degree angle and ends at a 90 degree angle. This stroke is used to play accented notes. Tap stroke starts at a 30 degree angle and ends at a 30 degree angle. This stroke is used to play non accented notes. The 
downstroke starts at a 90 degree angle and ends at a 30 degree angle. This stroke enables you to play an accented note and get set up for a non-accented note. The upstroke starts at a 30 degree angle and ends at a 90 degree angle. This stroke enables you to play a non-accented note and get set up for an accented note. It's so hard to make that second note of the double stroke roll strong. So, if you, you know, because a double stroke roll is basically right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left. Most people want to accent the first note, so make that first note louder. They want to go right, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left. So when they do double strokes, it's kind of like sloppy and just like It's really, there's no way to... The only way to build that double stroke roll is to accent the second note so you're putting emphasis on the second note. Up.
So I was just uh, playing a little uh, funk drumming for you. And um, I don't know, I like to, um, you know, when I play funk, I like to get different, like, tones out of the drums. You know, that's why I'm kind of just out here setting up, just kind of fooling around. And um, I wanted to show you how to, like, get different tones out of the snare. Because that, to me, is, like, the main part of, like, you know, the sound, like James Brown and stuff. He'd always have, like, three different snare tones going at once with just like a straight beat so um you know the tone the three tones i like to use are like the real fat fat back tone and that's kind of like playing in the center of the drum without hitting the rim and that's you know and using the butt end of the stick helps a lot as far as like getting that really fat tone and that kind of sounds like this Then what I like to do is I like to um, pr uh, put that with like the two other tones, and the two other tones that I want to use uh, that I use is uh, the higher pitch tone, which is more of like the James Brown sound or like Steve Jordan kind of made it like you know really popular, and that's hitting three inches off the butt end of the stick and hitting the rim. So that's that sounds like this. And see the difference between that's kind of more of like a flat AC DC tone, and this is like the high high pitch like James Brown type of tone. Then you got the third tone I like to use is both of those put together, but hitting in the middle of the drum, and that that kind of sounds like this. So it's kind it's it's both of them together hitting a rim shot and hitting in the center of the drum. So the three tones are this. And, and like let's say you're playing a two and four beat. And what I like to do is to really make it like funky is I, I like to make like the two a deep tone and the four a high tone. So if you're playing like one, two, three, four, and going one, two, three, that's like straight. With that same beat, I'll make it sound a little more funky by hitting two different tones. And that would sound like this. Like, see the difference? I mean, it's not, and then you add like some uh, grace notes under there, or some uh, underlining diddles, which um, kind of like make it even more sloppy and maybe adding some more on the kick, you get a really funky beat, and that would kind of sound like this. those little snare things that I'm doing using the utilizing the three different tones that I just showed you and you know kind of slopping it up really makes it funky um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the hi-hat and a couple different ways to play the hi-hat. Different situations, too. All right. um, let, me, let me show you some different ways to play the hi-hat. Uh, the, the first one is like with straight eighth notes. I like, um, it's kind of more of a rounder feel, you know, if like you're going to play like a um, kind of like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, Okay, let's see what I'm, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about the hi-hat. Okay, we're thinking of three different ways to play the hi-hat. And um, the first one I'm going to show you is this shank tip technique. And this is cool to like really get like a feel and a finesse for the hi-hat. Because you know, the hi-hat's actually a hard instrument to play. It's like the hardest thing to like start it when someone says count off a tune and it's like, one, two, three, four, you know, I mean, that doesn't really, it doesn't really work. What I'm going to show you right now is a nice, finesseful way to, like, to, to, to play that. And that's 
using the shank tip technique that I call, and that's playing all the downbeats with the shank. So if you're playing eighth eighth notes, it'd be one and it'd be one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four, and then playing the upbeats with the with the tip. And so it gives kind of like a, a, a nice finesse on the hi-hat, kind of going like this. And, that, and that's cool for like a rounder type of feel. Like if I'll just play a two and four beat and show you like a groove just, just playing that. good for breakdowns too like kind of playing like and then coming back in it gives a nice round feel to it that's that's one way I approach the hi-hat another way is like more of like the you know the hip like hip-hop type of the street type of sound for like hip-hop funk and that's like they're using more of a stiffer type of hi-hat sound because most of it's programmed. So when I first heard that, actually I was doing a session and um, I went in there. This is why I want to show you these three different uh, ways of playing the hi-hat because it's, it's important, I think, to learn all of them and be able to pull them out when you need it. Because I went into this hip-hop session and um, they, there was kind of a Tribe Called Quest type of beat. It was kind of like uh, eighth notes on the hi-hat and I was kind of playing it like this which is cool for a certain situation but they wanted the raw like you know hip-hop sound and they want they were they kept singing me like ah we want it like really stiff and so I went in there and I played all the shank and played all the eight all the eighth notes with the shank and made this kind of like emulated a drum machine type of sound and they loved it so it's like that's just playing only the shank and it kind of stiffens it up so they can kind of move around you know the hi-hat because they're rap they when they're rapping they need to like hear that solidness and and that's their that's their thing and I didn't really understand that until I like really dissected it and learned it on the hi-hat and learned how to do that. Especially like with the open hi-hats, especially in hip-hop, they want that open hi-hat like really loud. You know, and at first they were saying, open the, the open the hi-hat like do sa do do sa And I, I was going like <laughs> And they're going, no, we want it like powerful. So it was like I was really, you really got to like dig in and th these are the subtleties of the hi-hat that make like a beat funky you know so I, I had to really like you know accentuate that that eighth note I had to be like <laughs> and it kind of feels uncomfortable when I'm playing but like that's the sound they wanted you know it's like Normally, I would just go in there and, oh, I play the way I play, but, you know, that's not going to get you the gig. you got to really, like, listen and find out what's happening, you know, t in the sounds, especially, you know, like, like James Brown, like Funky Drummer. That beat, he's u only using the tip of the stick. He's like, you can tell he's, like, right on the tip. He's not going... Or... Those are sort of the two I just showed you. He's, he's right on the top and really light and really finesseful. And he's playing like... And when he's opening the hi-hat, he's opening it really lightly and, and, and with the tip of the stick. He's kind of... This is kind of a hard one to play, but it's a... You get the idea. I mean, that's sort of what the sound is. It's like those three different ways to play the hi-hat are like really important in order to make like a beat funky.
I want to tell you a little story that uh, happened. Uh, I want to tell you a little story that happened to me. Um, I was doing this session with uh, Gary Scheider from Funkadelic and uh, Mudbone from Bootsy's Rubber Band, and we were in the studio, and they were, they asked me to you know like play something really um, play something funky because we were writing some new tunes. So um, I thought, okay, you know, yeah, I, I'm cool. I can play all this cool stuff. So. I started, uh, I think the beat was, uh, I think it was like this, I was like... You know, something like that, and, and they kind of, they just looked, they were just staring at me, and I was going like, you know, like, what's wrong? You know, can you guys play something? And they're like, well, you know, they weren't moving to it, you know, they weren't moving their body to it, you know, because they were like... They, they couldn't understand where I was coming from because everything I was playing was like up here, you know, it was like in my head. It wasn't like, I didn't feel it. I wasn't like feeling, you know, like the bottom and the bass drum and then feeling the two and four and the snare. And they just wanted to hear something simple. They just wanted to hear just do, do, ga, do, do, ga, do, do, ga. So it like left space for them to play so they can play, you know, like Atomic Dog, like so they could play don't go 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 and they just wanted something straight you know they wanted me to just like lay down a beat that they can feel and they can like dance to so they were just like just play the simplest beat you can think of and I just played you know Well, that's, you know, that's not funky. There's not all these little embellishments in. That's what they wanted to add. They wanted to add, they wanted to go like. And they wanted that. And they wanted, and Gary wanted to add a guitar part that was, well, look, let me tell you this, like the James Brown tune. We were playing this James Brown tune, and um, the guitar part was something like, uh, Dent gank dent gank gant dent gank dent dent gank dent gank gant dent gank dent You know I heard that I thought okay I could I could play to that you know I was like and you know I was playing all these diddles and playing you know playing everything the guitar was playing the accents with my bass drum and snare and and you know, clogging this whole thing up, and and um, I was driving down the street one day, and I heard like um, the the tune, the actual, the the real James Brown tune, and the um, it was just like amazing what the drummer was playing. It was just like it just blew me away because he was just leaving all this space to let like the guitar and the bass and and the vocals and everything breathe, and and it, it went something like it went something like this. He was it was going like. And I mean, that just blew me out. I mean, just he was leaving so much space for I actually heard the guitar, I heard the bass, I could hear everything, and he's just playing just quarter notes on the hi-hat and just, you know, not playing the, the four of the whole, on the snare of the whole pattern, and it just, it just, you know, all of a sudden I could feel it. All of a sudden it, it went from, like, my head to my hips. All of a sudden it just, like, you know, and then I understood what, like, Gary and, and Mudbone were saying. They just wanted to feel something that they could play off of, not something that was, like, you know, that you have to think about.
anyways, the way I learned uh, my four-way coordination and independence in all four of my limbs is by practicing these ostinato patterns. And what I would do is like, I would take take like, let's say like a samba bass drum pattern, and I would learn that. Samba or a bayon bass drum pattern, and I would learn that with my feet. After I learned that, I would like add a snare. Maybe I would learn like put two and four to that, the samba and bayon pattern. Just a basic two and four backbeat and get my feet and left hand working. or I would add like some other kind of syncopated pattern. There's 13 different ways to break up the 16th note. And I would break that up, I'd write it out, break it up the 13 different ways and practice that with my uh, right hand and my rise cymbal. After that, I would practice like doing a solo with it by starting off very slow, starting off maybe just with one ostinato pattern with my uh, right hand, like playing maybe just quarter notes. And with those quarter notes, just building with the quarter notes or building with like eighth notes with my right hand, then adding different bass drum patterns and different syncopations with my left hand. But that way you learn to like get coordination while learning like really hip grooves at the same time.
did anything to embarrass us, did he? Can you remember anything? Not that I can remember. No. He was always a good boy. He uh, behaved very nicely, didn't he, Frank? Thank <laughs> you. 